All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Bob and Zach show, uh, at least today anyway. I think, Zach, you, you flew solo last week, I believe. Um, I was, yeah. I was uh, off hunting and, and uh, had a great time. And, and, uh, but now we're back to talk about fun things. Um, you know, Zach, today is an actually a really special day. Um, you may not be aware of it, but um, it's, it's exactly two weeks from when mercifully all of these texts and emails and commercials for the, the election are going to stop. I know that that is, uh, <laughs> that is something I look forward to every four years. How about you? Yeah, yeah, especially the the spam text. I'm, I've just, I've, I knew I needed something more in my life the last yeah. several elections. And this, it's really been proven to me that that was just the missing thing. Well, you I know, mean, this, this year, I'm doubly blessed because somehow the bots out there thought, think that I'm also my wife. And so they're texting me, Linda, have you blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> uh, save me. Anyway, so two weeks from today, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But that's kind of uh, part of what we're going to be talking about today, of course, doing what we do for people. Uh, we have lots of conversations with folks and, um, you know, everybody is uh, aware that there's a big election coming up. And uh, Zach, I started to, to just ask you, who are you going to vote for? Uh, but I'm not going to do that to you. I will tell you about an interesting conversation I had with my youngest son, Colin. He lives out in Nashville and uh, he went and voted yesterday. And, and, uh, and I said, who'd you vote for? And he says, well, you know, it's, it's really interesting, Dad. Um, Kanye made the ballot in Tennessee, and I really thought about voting for, <laughs> for president as a protest yeah. vote, but he didn't do it. So uh, I, I don't think Kanye made the uh, ballot in Texas. I guess it's a state-by-state -state thing, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I haven't. I've heard he didn't make it on every ballot in every state, but I've heard I haven't voted yet. Uh, yeah. So I'll admit that, but I heard he's maybe for vice president in Texas. I, I don't sure. know. I don't know. But, the uh, the options are are so uh, so interesting this year. Yeah. But mm -hmm. anyway, I, I have voted. Went out and voted early. And I hope hope uh, many of the folks joining us today have already taken advantage of that. And lines weren't too bad. It was it was it was busy, but it it moved fast. I was in and out probably in fifteen minutes. So, you know, we'll, we'll know two weeks from now what happens, maybe. Maybe it'll be four weeks from now before we know, who knows. But what I do know is that on November the 4th, the sun will still come up, uh, life will go on, whatever happens. And I also know that the market will always do whatever it has to do to fool the most people most of the time. And so, you know, I remember back in 2016, Everybody was freaking out. We had uh, now President Trump running against Hillary Clinton, and um, nobody expected that race to turn out like it did, surprise number one. And nobody expected the market to take off like a rocket following the, the presidential election, surprise number two. So, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen two weeks from now, no matter how much they prognosticate and predict. Um, but we do know that... Um, it is going to happen, the election, and there is going to be a winner. There is going to be a loser, and the markets are still going to do what the markets do. But, but this kind of gets into, I guess, Zach, talking a little bit about um, our, our point. Let's just start off by talking at a high level. I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this. Just in general, what is your opinion, based on your experience and observation over the last 10, 15 years, on how markets are are, are affected by presidential election cycles. What, what's your general take on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I had an assumption, I guess, uh, before I started in, in this field. And uh, it was that one political party uh, did better than the other. And I can say that um, as I've taken time um, with the last election and, and since then, and again, revisiting, this year, uh, surprisingly, um, when you look back at, okay, if, if uh, with the presidency, the House of Representatives and the Senate, if there's a party that has two of those, is there one of those parties that does better? Or is there a certain party that does better if there's a president mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, representing them in the Oval Office? 
And as it's, it's pretty much what most people would say is just a wash. And, and that was really surprising to me. I think it's, it's surprising to most of our clients that we speak with um, that when you really start to look historically at what the market has done, um, there's not really one political party that has uh, excelled the other. And so if, if, all, there, I, if there was, you can be sure that the political party that was that was best historically would be touting that all over the place. Right. There'd be a graph and we'd see, you know, red <laughs> years good, blue years bad or blue years good, red years bad. If, if I was a politician, I'd be trying to do that if I was, you know, with that party. That's for sure. Right. But, uh, right. But we don't but, see that. So what do you think? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, let's say you're talking with one of our clients and they're really freaked out about the election. They're worried. I mean, what, what just generally, what would your, your advice be to them? That we'll get into some specifics here in a minute, but yeah. generally, what would you say to somebody? Who's well, I think there? just in general, it's a good idea, we would say, to, to keep politics out of your portfolio. And yep. we, when one of the things that, that uh, has been a discussion topic recently is the fact that when we design your portfolio, if you're a client of ours already and you're watching, when we design your portfolio, uh, we're not designing it with a specific political party in mind. And so it's not, we don't have a, a wise council, uh, Republican portfolios and Democrat portfolios, and <laughs> we're not really trying <laughs> to make predictions here. And so really it's more about your specific situation your goals that you need to achieve, the amount of risk that you're comfortable taking. That's, those are really the pieces that, that go into developing the portfolio. And so a lot of times people will say, hey, hey, we need to adjust the portfolio because I think so-and-so is going to win or so-and-so is going to lose. And the thing is, is that the portfolio is not currently as it already is set up for the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. So. Now um, that is, that is such a great point, Zach. And, and, you know, Honestly, what I've seen over more than three decades now of watching these cycles and watching how human beings tend to react, um, you can have the, 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 the wisest, best portfolio allocation you know, on the planet. Mm -hmm. And all it takes <laughs> is one emotional wrong decision every year or two to completely undermine it, right? And right. So we, we really try, we're, we're not perfect, obviously, and, and so it's always needing attention and updates and tweaks, but we really try when we, when we are um, doing a, a game plan for our clients to, to dial, we, we like to think of it as dialing in the risk budget, right? You know, a little more, a little less, and all of that is done very thoughtfully with the, with the idea that, look, at any time, something bad can happen like COVID, right? Who knew that was coming? That was, <laughs> that was as random and crazy as 9-11 was. Who knew that was going to happen, right? When we woke yeah. up that day. So you just never know. And so we always are trying to be very thoughtful and mindful based on the client's needs, their plan, but also based on them as, as emotional beings. What can you accept and, and, and tolerate in terms of volatility? So that's how we try to approach it. And so nine out of 10 times, the best thing to do if that's been done properly on the front end is don't do anything, don't react. And we have a lot of those conversations, but look, uh, every now and then somebody's just like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm nervous, I can't sleep well, I, I just, I, just mm -hmm. I, I, need to, I need to take some risk off the table. All right, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, Zach, there's, there's, there's multiple ways you can approach managing risk in a portfolio, right? right. Um, and, and the most radical thing probably is, I want to go to cash. I just want to go to cash, and then I'll talk to you, you know, a couple of weeks after the election. Give me a little bit of feedback on that and pros and cons of doing that. Yeah, so uh, just like markets do not go in a, in a, a sustained, a linear fashion up or down, um, we typically have losses and we have gains that happen in spurts and that can happen in a relatively short time frame. And so if you go to all the way to cash, we may have one of those nice growth spurts, 
15% or so jump in the market and you'll miss, miss out on that. And I would, I would say to that person considering that, that the actual more difficult thing is not what to do today, but when do you, when do you go back or change in the future? Exactly. That's, that's harder than it is making a choice today. And right. so, um, you know, when we, <laughs> I mean, we just think back to the last election, right? If somebody would have done that, mm-hmm. they would have, they would have missed out on considerable uh, gains post-election. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you know, you're, you're right, Zach. And, and what we've seen uh, many times over the years is, you know, when you, when you look historically at returns, uh, and we're talking about generally the broad stock market here mm-hmm. in the U.S., um, you, you look at it and you say, oh, well, this year the market was up eight. That year the market was up 15. That year the market was down four. Well, those are 12 month chunks of time. What you don't see is that very often, uh, let's say the market's up 12%, you might've seen all of that return in maybe a 60 day window and the rest of the months were kind of just choppy, right? So you, you can miss an entire year's worth of return just sitting on the sideline for 30 or 60 days. And, and you know, obviously you don't know, what, nobody has a crystal ball to look at what's gonna happen next. And so I've seen it, when people get out, it, like you just said, it's just as emotionally difficult to decide, well, is this really mean the dangers pass, and should I really get in? And so I'll give it, a, I'll give it another week. Eh, maybe, maybe I'll start in second quarter. And but then you get in, and <laughs> the market's a cruel master, Zach. Then it, it has a five percent correction. So not only did you miss the ride up, but you caught the five percent correction. I mean, it is, yeah. it is just, it is a recipe for bad things happening. So we're we're not big fans of. Um, of trying to time that it just rarely, rarely works out in your favor as a serious long-term investor. But that is one thing that, you know, people can do. And if they're completely freaking out about this and they just can't stand it, you know, then that's one option. Now, another option is um, uh, the traditional way to risk manage a portfolio going back to maybe the forties and fifties, this idea that you've maybe heard of uh, modern portfolio theory, and it's the idea of finding the, the, the amount of, of, of different asset classes that you blend together. We've all seen the pie chart, right? And how much of the pie is in stocks? How much is in bonds? How much is in real estate? How much is in cash? Um, maybe you've got a little pie slice with alternative investments like gold or those kinds of things. And the idea there is you're kind of like hedging your bets um, and that's a, a fairly effective way to, to, to manage risk. And in a sense, in our approach, we do a little bit of that. We don't do it in the traditional way when we build portfolios because we're using individual strategies for each of those pie wedges. Um, not, not so much um, you know, what, what we see a lot of other, uh, well, what I did for many years in, in the practice, but then it, it's just a, it's a higher level of that. But what we really wanted to spend the rest of the time today talking about was kind of a third way that you can hedge. And we like to say we, we want to make the, uh, the complex simple around here. Sometimes the things that we are trying to educate folks on, they, they get very technical. And I thought today I would, uh, I would really try to boil this discussion, Zach, down to a, a couple of simple visuals that we'll, we'll look at here in a second. But when people hear the, the phrase, you know, hedging, um, I don't, I mean, some folks are, are, are more aware of what that means than others, but a lot of folks that sounds scary, you know, hedge yeah. funds, they've heard uh, just at a high level, explain what we mean when we're talking about hedging. Well, hedging is, is basically in a, in a word, it's just protecting. It's, it's uh, a lot of times people think of risky or, uh, you know, some kind of high end, the finance or something like that. I think that that because people have heard the phrase hedge fund that and, and the things associated, kind of the stigma around them that they that word has been linked to that. But hedging is really just protecting something um, from from some risk. Mm-hmm. Well, there's and there's a number of ways that you can do that, but we're going to talk about one idea today. That, um, that I think will be interesting to folks. Give me a second here. I'm trying to share my screen. All right. 
So if we were sitting around in the conference room, I might draw something like this, Zach, to have this discussion. Are you seeing on the screen the, uh, the whole circle and the, the, uh, the portfolio here that I'm hypothetically going to be talking about? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> really high level stuff here, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, forgive me audience, but we're trying to, we're trying to focus on a particular idea here and I wanted to keep this simple. So, so Zach here, what we're talking about is a really basic concept of uh, somebody with a, a, their, their life savings. And let's say it's 2 million bucks. Uh, they've done a good job of saving over the years and they just, you know, they're, they're concerned about this election. They're concerned about COVID, whatever. They're really worried. And um, so if we drew a line down the middle of their pie, half of the stuff they already own is, is we'll call it safe stuff. Uh, you know, that might be cash. It might be really conservative bonds, things like that. Maybe some annuities, whatever, you know, that things that aren't going to really fluctuate much with the market. So we're really not concerned about that half of the pie. We're concerned about the other half, and that's what we're calling on this simple little pie chart, our risky stuff. So if we've got half of our money in safe stuff, that's a million bucks, and we got half of our money in risky stuff, that's another million bucks, then we're going to talk about this idea of it's possible to, to do a direct hedge of risk against the risky stuff in your portfolio. And that's what we wanted to explain today. You see in this, uh, you see in this slide? Yes, with the, the two columns. Yeah, okay. So what we're, what we're showing here is that um, the, the little blue bar on the left, that would represent um, the S&P 500. So if the S&P 500 uh, was up 10%, that's what the above the black line shows. If it was gonna move down, 10%, that's what below the black line shows. And we have the ability, uh, financial uh, folks like us, we have the ability to go in and, and look at your risky stuff, going back to that circle, right? And how much was there? A million dollars. And we can say, all right, based on, the, on what you have in your portfolio, how much is your pile of risky stuff gonna move relative to what the S&P would move if it went up 10% or down 10%. And, and so let's say that, that Zach, that my, ha my half of that pie, my risky portfolio half, um, if the S&P was up, my stuff would be up 7%. And if the S&P was down, my stuff would be expected to be down 7%. Now, none of this is guaranteed. These are all just based on historical uh, you know, analysis looking backwards. And there's a technical investment term for that, Zach, what, that, that ratio we're talking about there. What is it? So that is beta. And beta, beta yeah. uh, by definition, is just the, um, the, the proportion uh, of risk, or it's a measure of the risk or volatility that a individual stock or a group, a basket of stocks, a portfolio, in this case, a million dollars, how does the, the volatility of that million risky stuff compare to the volatility of the market? And right. so it's just, it's a percentage comparison. Right. Um, so it, uh, just a, a number that quantifies the risk from one relative to the other. Right. So if we wanted to go out and protect ourselves on the S&P over there, we, we could use another financial instrument called an option uh, or a put option, right? Just briefly explain what a put option would do just relative to the S&P itself there on the left. So the put option is, is a contract. It's, a, it's something that you can buy. And when you buy it, it gives you the right to sell something at a certain price in the future. So you don't have to sell it at that price, but you have the, you have the option, right? <laughs> and let's, yeah. let's, say, let's say that that black line represents our price, whatever it is on the S&P, mm -hmm. the day you buy the contract um, for the date you're buying it for. Let's say, let's say uh, December 15th is the day you want. You want to have your option. You want to be protected up through December 15th. 
and uh, we have our price when we start. Um, and, and so kind of relate that to this graph. So right now, the black line, the, the S and P 500 is currently, it's just under, uh, 3,500 or 3,500. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you could buy a put that would give you the right to sell the S and P 500 between now and whatever day there's different dates that you can buy. But, uh, in the case of this strategy, um, currently we would purchase one going to about, uh, December 18th. And so you could buy a put that would give you the right to sell the S and P 500 between now and December 18th for that 30, roughly $3,500. And it would cost something to buy it. You're basically, you're, you're buying a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point in the future. Yeah. And so I, I wrote down at the bottom of the green bar, my risky stuff. Um, if it's going to move about 70% down in a, in a bad situation of what the S and P would do, then I don't have to, I don't really have to hedge a hundred percent, uh, you know, all of the S and P I only have to hedge enough of it to represent how much my portfolio would move down. And, and so in this case, uh, roughly 700,000 is, is, is going to track um, the equivalent of the risk of a million dollars in the S&P 500. So all we have to do, if we want to protect ourselves, I kind of like to think of it like, like uh, insurance on your, on your house, fire insurance, you know, major disaster. If your house burns down, um, you write a premium for that. And when you write that check, you know, that's spent money. It's gone. Um, and, it only helps you, other than the peace of mind it gives you, it only helps you if the house burns down or something big happens, right? Then you get a big check from the insurance company. And I kind of think of, of this direct hedging approach as similar. Um, you, you, you calculate how much uh, of the put options on the S&P you have to, to buy. We do that in, in one of our strategies we'll talk about here in a second. And so it allows us, it's just mathematics, it allows us to get pretty precise on how many of these S&P put contracts we have to buy to tell us where our, our losses are going to kind of be, they're not exactly capped, but we can, we can dial that in to maybe a, I can live with a 5% loss on my risky stuff or a 10% or a 20%. Now, the, the more risk I can live with on my risky stuff, the less it's going to cost me. So on a, on a homeowner insurance thing, right? The bigger your deductible, the lower your premium, same concept, same thing on auto insurance, anything like that. So we have the ability to, to get pretty, pretty uh, dialed in on the amount of risk on that half of the portfolio in this case. And I know that here in a second, you've got some examples, the, these, these prices for these uh, put options, they, they're traded uh, daily and they fluctuate a lot uh, many times based on what's happening in the real world in the last 24 hours. And we'll, we'll end on that here in a minute, but I want to go and just kind of hone in a little bit on this particular strategy that we run. And, and I will tell you, Zach, this, this is not for everybody. This is next level stuff, I think. Um, but, but not just next level stuff. This is, uh, I think, only for folks who are really, really, really worried. Uh, because I think we can do an adequate job uh, portfolio protecting with, with our, our ability to blend strategies together. But, but that's not enough for everybody. If, if you're not sleeping yeah. well night and if you're, you're just super worried, uh, I think that this can be very effective rather than going to what we think is one of the worst approaches, which is putting everything in cash and then trying to time when you're going to get back in. Um, right. So speak to, just briefly, speak to this particular slide and kind of what this is saying here, what this, what this is talking about. Yeah, so there, there's basically different three different protection levels that are offered here with Mission Hedge. And those protection levels are five, 10, or 20%. Um, and so the intention is to, to say on that risky stuff portion of your portfolio, um, you know, there's not really the need to, 
to protect on the more conservative, less risky aspect, but on the, on those things that are more volatile and risky, how much loss would you be comfortable having there? Some people are, they could live with a 20% downward move on that portion of their portfolio and be comfortable. Other people are much more concerned and, and may want to, you know, protect against losses that, that exceed five or 10%. Well, let me, let me jump in there and, and just do some simple math here in case this hasn't yet dawned on, on somebody watching. 20% of half of my portfolio, right? Because remember, that's the part we're talking about is my risky half. Mm -hmm. 20% of, of a million dollars is $200,000 potentially. If, if let's say that I hedged at the 20% kind of bottom, that's what I'm, I'm willing to accept. But if that happened and my, and my strategy works and I'm, I'm down $200,000, $200,000 relative to the whole pie of 2 million is only a 10% loss. Right. And, and so, you know, it, it's a simple math, but somebody might not be comfortable with a 20% loss on their portfolio, but we're not talking about the whole portfolio here. We're just talking about the parts that are, that are the more volatile parts. Right. And, and so that's where we can go in and we can really fine tune uh, based on what, what your kind of worst case scenario you, you, you think you can live with. Because let's face it, you can't invest without some risk, without volatility. The, the trade-off is I was having a conversation this weekend with some family members and they're like, ah, oh, my, my bank uh, savings are renewing and I was getting two and a half percent. Now I'm going to get 0.65%. You know, what, it's not even close to what inflation has been. Uh, so everything has its pros and its cons, right? There's going to be some volatility if you're going to be an investor, but right. you can go in and you can put some, uh, let's call them safety nets under, underneath the more volatile pieces, but nothing is free. There's a cost for this. So let's wrap this up. We got a few more minutes by you. I think you looked up like our pricing as of last night on these three risk levels, give us an idea of what it costs. And, and so, and, and let's kind of try to put some numbers to that. So people kind of have an idea what it would actually cost to do this for yeah. half of the portfolio in this example. Yeah. So if we, if we go back to that, that slide that shows the, the million and the 700,000, um, this one, this slide here. So to protect the million, the half of the 2 million, the 50% of the risky stuff currently today, the rate to do that to protect from um, a 20 losses over 20%, uh, that would be about $4,200. So it works out to just over half a percent um, of the 700,000. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's less than half a percent on the million. Really, what you're protecting. 700,000 is the amount that we use to, to decide how much is needed, but we're still protecting that full million dollar uh, portion of the portfolio, the risky stuff million dollar portion. And so $4,200 of that is, is basically 0.4%, under half a percent. To do 10%, it would be about 12,600. And to do 5%, to protect any loss greater than 5%, it would be about nineteen thousand six hundred dollars, uh, which is which is uh, you know a little less than two percent. Now again, that's that's to protect until December eighteenth. So if we ran this this strategy and we wanted to protect against that just that short time frame window of time, then there would be a cost to do it. It's like that it's like that insurance premium on the that, that house insurance premium or the auto insurance premium. Um, if we don't use it, then it was a cost. It's gone. And so that really, that really brings up an important thing here. Some people would say, well, why aren't we doing this all the time on the whole portfolio? Well, because that would get really expensive, right? If we did that all the time, but we do get into these unique time periods and these unique events where we can do things on a shorter time frame, and it might be worth the cost to certain people. Yeah. Well, that's a great that's a great place for us to kind of start landing this jet uh, and wrapping it up for today. You know, it, it, I'll just say that if, if I was looking at this, 
And, and I was thinking to myself, all right, so it cost me about 19 to 20 grand um, if I want to protect my risky stuff to where it's pretty much not going to fall overall more than about 5%. Mm -hmm. That's, that's pretty darn conservative, right? Um, but maybe it's worth it. If I got a $2 million portfolio, maybe my peace of mind and sleeping at night, maybe it's worth it to me to, to say, Hey, I'm going to buy a $19,000, you know, uh, option, uh, that I can, I can not worry markets do. Um, but on the other hand, if I, if I'm, if I'm a little more comfortable with a little more risk, then it's, I think you said it's going to cost about 12,000 for a 10%, uh, floor protection, and, but it's only like 4,000 for a 20%. And as we said earlier, that 20% of half equates to about 10% of the whole. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's about as technical as I wanted to get today, Zach. And I'll just, I'll wrap this up today by saying to everybody, um, we're, not, we're not freaking out about the presidential election. It's, it's just the latest thing that the media wants to harp on. Um, is it important? Sure. Go vote, you know, do what you need to do there, but don't let this steal your joy. I mean, it's just not, it's not legitimate that, that we think that, um, you know, everything is going to change on the turn of this election. But if you, if you are really nervous about it, that's one of the primary things that we're here for is to help you kind of think this stuff through and, um, and, and make good decisions for you. We like to say anyone can make better financial decisions with the right advice. And we are here to give you advice. If you want to, to put yourself in a safer, protected downside position, uh, Zach or I are happy to have this conversation with you, run some analytics on your actual holdings, go back and look at your plan and say, what does this money really need to do for you? How soon are you needing income off of it? All of those things are variables Ultimately, it needs to be customized to your circumstances. But um, I think most of our clients, Zach, I think, I think the ones that are, uh, that are needing this kind of a discussion, I think we've talked with most of them. Maybe there's somebody we haven't talked to yet. But it's more likely that if you're watching this, you may know somebody who maybe doesn't work with somebody like us. Maybe they, they could use this kind of a discussion and help. Uh, we're obviously always happy to meet your friends and acquaintances. So with that, Zach, we're going to wrap it up. You got any final thoughts or, or comments before we say goodbye? Yeah, I, I will say we kind of touched on this at the beginning. Um, this We could have a conversation about this today or tomorrow and the next day. The, the, the price to do this protection, it's it changes rapidly. It, it could double. Um, it could double. Or it double could right. And it, and it has been double over the last month. Um, we we have been watching this and the cost has been more expensive at times. So, um, you know, we don't want to wait until things get, if we wait until things get bad, then it's just going to be too expensive to, to put in place really. No, I'm and really glad. I'm really glad you made that point. That, that is really important. We don't want people calling us up and then you look at the stats for that day and say, <laughs> well, today is 38,000 to hedge on 20%. You know, yeah. uh, we can't control what the pricing of options are doing. That's going to be a function of the market. And so just, just understand that guys, don't call us up and be mad at us. If options get more expensive the day we're actually looking at it, we have no control over that. We just look at the markets day to day and depending on what scary headline or good headline came out the day before it can affect the options market immediately. Right. Adequately. Right. All right, Zach, well, we're going to wrap it up with everybody. I hope, I hope these kinds of discussions are helpful and interesting to you. Um, you guys have a great day and we will be back here next week. I'm not sure what, what's on the topic uh, list next week, Zach, but it'll be something interesting. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all here next week. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.